Thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrea McEwen Henderson, and I will be your host today. I am one of the national account managers with College Recruiter. College Recruiter is the leading niche job board used by recent college graduates to find entry level jobs and students to find internships. Today, we will be speaking with Anna Escrahima, a Foreign Service officer serving as a diplomat in residence at the City College of New York. Prior to this assignment, Anna was the Deputy Director for Syria in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs at the Department of State. Anna, I want to again thank you for joining us today. So let's discuss the State Department's Diplomat in Residence Program. But first, can you just give us a background about you and what made you want to be involved with the Foreign Service as a career? Sure, Andrea. Thanks, and thank you for uh, for hosting me today. I'm really excited for uh, for this opportunity. Uh, the State Department is looking to recruit a, uh, a dynamic and diverse uh, workforce for uh, the 21st century, and so I'm glad to have this opportunity to engage with, with this audience. A little bit about myself. I am speaking to you from, as you said, City College in New York. New York City is where I was born and raised. Uh, pretty much on the other side of, of Manhattan from where we are in the Lower East Side. And I, it, I think it all started with me probably in high school. I took a French class and that sort of opened doors for me in terms of feeling like this was a language that I was interested in and passionate about and actually able to use it to communicate with people from other cultures and in multiple countries, not only in France, but in, in the Francophone world. And that sort of planted that, that bug. Everyone has that moment where that international affairs bug gets planted. Um, and so that was it for me. When I went to undergrad at Brown University, I majored in international relations and French and decided to study abroad. And, uh, and again, really enjoyed the experience of living and traveling abroad. And so I went to grad school right after undergrad. I went to Columbia, the School of International and Public Affairs where I began to study Arabic. I was actually in my second Arabic class ever on September 11, 2001, here in, in New York City. And, uh, you know, again, being from here, it was just a very um, interesting and intense time to become interested in Arabic in the Middle East. And I decided that I wanted to go overseas and serve. I, um, I did internships. I did an internship in the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt and also at the State Department and the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. And after graduation, I, I joined the State Department in June of 2003. And after that, I, as a first assignment, I went to Tunis, Tunisia, where I continued to study Arabic. And then I went to Damascus, Syria, Baghdad, Iraq, Dubai, and then returned to the United States. After, after seven years overseas, I decided it was time to uh, come back home. And I did a number of various policy jobs back at the State Department, back at headquarters. One of them, as you said, was as the uh, Deputy Director for Syria at the Department of State. I also served as an advisor to the Undersecretary for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, as a member of the U.S. delegation to the nuclear talks with Iran. I also got to serve as part of the team of public diplomacy officers during the beginnings of the Arab Spring, looking at various policy responses and how the U.S. could be supportive of the democratic changes and transition happening. And so it's been a pretty great career so far, 12 years. I think in 12 years I've done nine different assignments and I'm looking forward to, to the next adventure. So that's a little bit about how I, I got started and what, um, what I've been up to so far. But a little bit about what I'm doing right now as a diplomatic residence. In this capacity, I'm actually a recruiter for the State Department, and so I'm based here in New York, and I cover New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut, and I do exactly what we're doing now. I have conversations with students, faculty, staff, professional associations, anyone and everyone who is interested in learning more about how they can pursue a career with the State Department, how they can get an internship with the State Department. Maybe they might be interested in one of our fellowships, and we'll talk a bit about that later. But I am here to serve as a resource, answer questions, and actually be a diplomat in residence on this campus for people to use as a resource. Fascinating. 
That is fascinating. So what exactly is a diplomat in residence and how can audiences connect with you? Sure. So I am one of 16 foreign service officers, real life diplomats based on college campuses across the United States. And we're pretty easy to find. If you go to our careers website, that's careers.state.gov, and you click on connect, we actually have a map of the United States. And based on your geographical region where you're located, you can click on your state and a picture, for example, if you're in Pennsylvania, you click on that map and a picture of me will pop up and you can actually send me an email with any question you might have about some phase of the foreign service process or how can I look at opportunities to work with the civil service or, hey, I'm interested in this internship. And so we have um, a, a steady flow of email communication with prospective candidates. I also do information sessions um, on university campuses or for professional associations. Sometimes I even go to high schools as well. And I speak about the career and, and, and what opportunities are out there. And I also taught a class. I taught a very uh, uh, amazing group of graduate students, a course called U.S. Diplomacy in the Middle East. So it really is an opportunity for the public to connect with us. Also, as foreign service officers, we represent American citizens, and it's a great opportunity for us to be based on these campuses and really connect with the audiences that we're representing overseas before we, we head out again. So the program is the State Department's way of putting diplomats on campuses and on the ground to have a direct connection and relationship with the public uh, that's interested in learning more about what we do and in potentially joining our ranks. Great, great. So how is the State Department actually organized to carry out U.S. foreign policy objectives? So as you know, our uh, uh, big boss, that's Secretary Kerry, John Kerry, and he serves as the principal advisor to President Obama on foreign policy issues. Um, but he also sits atop a massive um, uh, organization that is the State Department that is actually uh, over 70,000 employees. So we are headquartered in Washington, D.C., but we also have um, uh, over 275 embassies and consulates abroad, and uh, that includes uh, about 8,000 Foreign Service officers who uh, travel um, uh, overseas. And um, we have also Foreign Service Specialists. There are about almost 6,000 Foreign Service Specialists. And whereas Foreign Service Officers are generalists who throughout the course of a career will do a range of, of different jobs, Specialists are uh, people who have such a, a specialized skill, for example, um, doctors, construction engineers, security specialists, IT specialists. They will go from um, embassy to embassy practicing this uh, particular uh, skill. So we have generalists, we have specialists. Um, we also have uh, uh, foreign service nationals. Actually, the majority of State Department employees are, uh, of, uh, are, are not American citizens. They are the local nationals who we uh, hire overseas. For example, the embassy in U.S. Embassy in um, Jordan. We have hundreds of Jordanian employees who work at the embassy and they actually are institutional memory and continuity, whereas the American officers are sort of transitioning from uh, you know, assignment to assignment. It is our local nationals who remain and who serve as that institutional memory. So they're everything from political analysts to um, you know, construction engineers, embassy drivers, economic analysts. And so we work side by side with our, uh, our colleagues, our locally employed staff colleagues, and, um, and, and we all sort of together create this huge uh, State Department family. We also have over 10,000 civil service employees, and these are uh, civil service essentially is uh, the, the core of policy practitioners who are based primarily in, in, in the United States. And so whereas civil service remains domestic, foreign service uh, is primarily, um, your, your assignments are primarily overseas. So we're a pretty large cabinet agency, again, over, over 70,000. And given all of the uh, U.S. foreign policy challenges out there, this is the team that we need to, to get the job done. So um, just a little bit about how um, I said we're headquartered in Washington, D.C., but we also, um, obviously, we're structured overseas in the form of an embassy, a U.S. mission. 
and uh, every embassy from you know um, Paris to Ouagadougou to Santiago has a, a, a U.S. ambassador or a chief of mission. And then uh, there is a deputy chief of mission who's the number two, um, whereas the ambassador is the um, uh, appointed by the president of the United States. Um, the deputy chief of mission is the, the number two and is almost the uh, sort of the CEO kind of making sure, the chief operating officer almost making sure that the trains are running on time. Um, and then we have uh, various sections, the political section, the economic section, the consular section, the public diplomacy section, and the management section. And each of these sections uh, deal with all the various uh, uh, functions of the U.S. mission overseas. And so the ambassador is the face of the embassy, is the personal um, representative of the president of the United States in this country, and uh, leads this, this mission of, of foreign policy professionals. Wow. Well, what have been some of your most challenging personal and professional experiences that you've had in this type of career? I think the, the most exciting part of this career is also can be sometimes the most challenging part of it, which is this adventure of moving from country to country, um, starting a new job, um, meeting new colleagues, and uh, settling in again, I think is for me, um, an incredible experience getting to know people, getting to know the country. But it can also be uh, uh, challenging to leave your friends and family, um, uh, you know, uh, time after time, and and that feeling of sort of starting over again. Oftentimes, uh, given the challenges of diplomacy these days, sometimes we're asked to serve in very intense and and, and difficult places. And while uh, there can be challenges there, sometimes these are some of the most uh, rewarding and interesting uh, assignments and really places where um, where uh, uh, American diplomacy really can make make a difference. So I would say I, I think um, my first assignment, saying goodbye to my mom, you know, <laughs> at the airport and, um, you know, obviously making plans for her to come visit, which she did, uh, I think uh, is, is one of the greatest challenges I'm very close to, to, to my family. So. Nice, nice. What motivates you and keep you going? What motivates me is the sense that I am doing what I'm passionate about and that what I'm doing makes a difference in the lives of the people that I work with, makes a difference in the issues that I'm interested in and the region that I'm interested in. And what motivates me is that there's always something new and different that comes up with every assignment. There's a new intellectual challenge. What other job would you get paid to learn uh, a foreign language, learn a new um, substantive I I issue set, meet a whole new group of people, figure out what's making the society tick, and sending information back to, to Washington to help keep policymakers um, informed and, and, and make good policy? I think it's just been, what motivates me is this sense that this is a series of, of adventures. And beyond just being uh, a career, it's also, it's also a lifestyle. Often your colleagues overseas become a, a, a second family, and I think that that's a, a pretty unique characteristic of the service. And lastly, what would you advise the next generation seeking to join the State Department? That's a great question. I, in this job, uh, as, a, as an advisor and as a professor, I do come across lots of students, whether you know undergrad students, graduate students, who are very concerned about whether or not they ha they have it, they have what it takes, do they have the right expertise, do they have the right substantive background. And I would say, I would encourage people, if foreign affairs or foreign policy or the State Department is what you're interested in, you should go for it. I would say that we're not looking for people who have a specific background in international relations or public policy, although obviously that is helpful and beneficial. We're really looking for people with the right skill set. We're looking for people Right well. We're looking for people who are good communicators. We're looking for people who uh, demonstrate composure under fire and can adapt to different um, cultural contexts. And so the, the thought is that we bring in people with the right skills and then we train them in languages. We train them in the substance that they need to know to, to get the job done. So number one, first piece of advice, don't self-select yourself out. Um, regardless of your background, there are people who come in with a science background, an arts background, a theater background, um, really an engineering background. We have former lawyers, we have 
folks who come in and are doing this as, as a second career, it really is uh, a diverse grouping of people who join the foreign service and the civil service. So that's the first thing. Um, uh, the second thing is persevere. If you don't get the, the, if you don't pass the exam the first time around, try again. Some of our most senior and distinguished officers really didn't pass the exam the first time around, maybe passed it the second or, or third time. And so I would encourage people to use the study guides that we make available on the careers website, careers.state.gov. Stay connected with us uh, through social media platforms and try to, uh, try to um, uh, really think about this as, uh, as a process. Thank you so much, Anna, and for sharing information with us about careers in the Foreign Service. And again, I can't thank you enough. I was personally fascinated by everything you shared, and I think other people are going to find it quite informative and really kind of open them up on how they can serve our country. So thanks again for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure.